Welcome to this session at the Global Humanist Congress. Uh, my name is Martin Rosen. I am a trustee of the British Humanist Association. I'm also a cartoonist for The Guardian and for Index on Censorship. And on the panel today, we have Jim Gamble, who's a very good friend of mine, uh, is now the director of English Pen, and formerly the editor of Index on Censorship. Uh, next to her is Mike Harris, who is now campaign director at Don't Spy on Us and used to work for. Index. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, Podrick Reedy, who is just described as a journalist, but he certainly has previously worked for Index on Censorship. Uh, so, really, I think that we should be discussing how journalism in this country is in the stranglehold of a sinister clique of a uh, front organisation called Index on Censorship. I suspect it won't necessarily be like that. Uh, <laughs> It says here, uh, when opening the event, please have the audience do something to encourage them to get to know each other. This morning it's very easy because I was in a session discussing sex, so we just all had sex. <laughs> but, um, get the message out, that's how you're going to um, get come together today. And um, when this is going to work, I'm going to ask each of our panel to speak for between five and ten minutes on the chosen topic, uh, and then we'll open it up to the floor and we'll just see how it goes. Uh, and we are going to start, I believe, with Jo, because um, Mike and Podrick decided she should go first. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the sisters. <laughs> so, um, as Martin has rightly observed, we did all used to work together as colleagues at Index on Censorship. And I think for all of us, one of the most decisive moments when we were all still there was um, the phone hacking scandal and the decision then to have the Leveson inquiry. Um, and that was and remains a decisive moment. And I think what we're, the, this whole um, uh, Congress is devoted to freedom of expression and we've heard, those of you who are at the plenary this morning heard remarkable stories of incredible courage uh, displayed by people in Pakistan, um, Bangladesh and elsewhere. And so what I'm gonna be talking about sounds in comparison minute and relatively unimportant, but it's something that I think um, is crucial to what's going on at the moment uh, in this country um, and elsewhere in Europe. Um, and what we've seen, and um, it's something I'm puzzling over, and so I'm, I'm going to just throw out some sort of ideas as to try and explain what's happened. Um, what we're seeing since the, the, the phone hacking revelations and the Leveson inquiry and the recommendations of Leveson what we've, what we've seen is a split in the traditional free speech community. Uh, many of the writers, the academics, the journalists, the editors who would traditionally be supporting the work of Index on Censorship or English Pen um, have moved away um, and have become very um, uh, significant supporters of Hacked Off, which, as many of you will know, um, is the very influential lobbying organization um, that played a big part in making the Leveson Inquiry happen and has been um, very insistent in its campaigning that we have effective press regulation in the wake of the phone hacking scandals. For those of you who don't know about the phone hacking scandals, um, these were um, originally um, revealed by The Guardian. The Guardian um, doggedly pursued um, phone hacking, the, the story that the news of the world um, had been hacking the phones of famous people on an industrial scale and this was batted away, the police didn't pursue the investigation, the Crown Prosecution Service didn't pursue it, but in the end the whole thing exploded and um, the country was scandalised in particular by the case of a, of a murdered girl, a, a missing girl who was later found to be murdered, whose phone had been hacked and the revulsion um, the public revulsion that there was um, at that event um, led to the news of the world ultimately being closed down um, and um, was very important um, in influencing um, the debate that's followed. Um, so I'm going to have to do this really briefly because we could spend um, the whole of Congress talking about the minutiae of this very complicated um, scenario. But um, there was an inquiry um, that was led by a judge, Lord Justice Leveson. Um, and at the end of this inquiry, 
um, into, the, into the media. What was proposed um, was that what was needed was independent self-regulation. Um, it's not the first time that, that the British press that there have been calls. It's, it happens intermittently over the years that there are calls that something has to be done um, about the conduct of the press. Um, and it was generally agreed that the Press Complaints Commission, which was in place, had not done its job effectively. What was proposed was what was called independent self-regulation, which meant that the press would still regulate itself, but that what would be set up was a body that would, that would effectively audit the regulator, that would be, that would be truly independent. Um, and um, it was very swiftly, by all the parties and by the press themselves, the recommendations were, were generally um, welcomed. Um, what was not welcomed at all by the press was the idea that there would be any legislation that would underpin this new system. And it ended up with something of a fudge, which nobody really wanted, which, which is that a royal charter was brought in. And the royal charter would effectively do this job um, of um, underpinning um, this proposal. We're now waiting, nothing, nothing's happened, nothing, nothing has, has, has been set up yet. Um, no regulator has been set up, but the press, the majority of the press have gone up to set up uh, their own regulator that obeys some of the recommendations, but, but, but many, many of them are, are ignored. But what I, what I, so that's just a very, very brief summary of, of where we are, but what I'm just interested, what I am puzzled by is that while um, I don't think I or any of my colleagues would condone any of the criminal activity um, that went on, and it was shocking, and what has been revealed is an extraordinary nexus of power, uh, the influence and power and control and bullying of, of Rupert Murdoch's newspapers, um, the close, their closeness to politicians, um, their closeness to the police, quite extraordinary network was exposed and I, and I don't think any of us would, would condone that. But as free speech campaigners we do have real concerns about many aspects of what's proposed. We have real concerns that the Royal Charter for example will allow political interference um, on, on a scale that, that we, we won't have seen in this country for hundreds of years. We're concerned about these sticks that have been brought, and there are carrots and sticks that, 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 that were proposed by this inquiry, um, and the carrot involves low-cost arbitration, uh, the, the, and the, the sticks include costs. Um, if you don't join the new regulator, you may end up having to pay the cost of both sides, even if you win the case, even if the story that you published was true. So we have real concerns about this, and, and, and as a result, cannot, cannot support what's being proposed. And so what, what, is a pu but what is the puzzle to me and what I'm, what I'm interested in talking about today is how is it that other traditional supporters of freedom of expression, the writers, the journal some of the journalists, editors, artists, academics, wholeheartedly have supported the call to support the Royal Charter, to support Leveson's proposals, and do not share do not share those, those worries. Um, Hacked Off includes uh, campaigners that I've worked with and still work with, and, and it's been very, very um, uh, puzzling and, and, and difficult to find myself on the other side from people who I respect very much and I've worked with very closely. So I've basically got three kind of theories. <laughs> um, one is, that Murdoch and the rise of Murdoch to power, the beginning of the creation of his empire, goes back more than 30 years. It goes back to Thatcher. Uh, and it coincides as, well, what happened as a result as well was the smashing of the unions, a complete revolution in the way that newspapers are created, and the beginning of um, Murdoch's extraordinary rise to power. And it is that one of the, the, the very critical areas that, that this inquiry didn't tackle at all is what do you do about that power? Because the fact that Rebecca Brooks, the editor of the News of the World, at, when she was editor of the News of the World, Andy Coulson, um, that they, you know, that they were able to get close to every prime minister, that they were able to sort of have a kind of reign of terror to a degree, that, you know, you don't do what we want, we'll kind of go into your life and we'll destroy it. That, it all goes back to that point when, when he was given that power without the Monopolies and Merger Commission coming into it at all. So I think it's, on one level, it's very hard to disentangle the left's feelings about Murdoch and Thatcher 
from that period. And I feel there's a real sort of political memory there that underpins uh, the response to, to what's being proposed. The other issue is privacy. Uh, that that um, over the past 10, 10 to 15 years, with the Human Rights Act coming into force, we effectively have a privacy law. And we have seen, um, if you like, the sphere of privacy grow. Um, so that, you know, there was one very famous case involving the supermodel Naomi Campbell where it was ruled ultimately in Europe um, that she was, even though she was in a public place when the photograph was taken, her privacy was being invaded. So the whole protection of privacy has grown. I think the awareness of privacy has grown. And I think that privacy is put in the balance with free speech as it has to be sometimes. And I think sometimes what we're finding is that the, the, the sympathy is much more for privacy than freedom of expression. And there are, obviously there are many cases when that is the right judgment. Um, but I think that the, the, uh, the, the growth of that awareness of privacy is part of what has sort of shifted to change, I think, in the public mood. And it's also no coincidence, I think, that the laws that came in that made phone, ha phone hacking illegal, it happened at exactly the same time that the Human Rights Act came in. And that was essentially because at that time it was only the, the spooks who could hack the phones. Uh, it's a coincidence, I think, that mobile phones came in at that point too. Um, and when the Human Rights Act came in, the government essentially had to make sure that, that it was compliant. The f my final um, uh, feeling about this is that if this is something that I think that to some degree we've been exploring uh, so far all the way through this Congress, and that is about attitudes towards human rights um, over the past 20, 25 years. And I think it's, it, this, and this is something I mentioned the other day, that there is something very decisive that happened 25 years ago with the fatwa. And that was one of the first times when we saw the liberal establishment who traditionally support freedom of expression, who you would <coughs> expect to support Salman Rushdie at that mm. time, that there was quite shocking the number who came out and said, actually, he's made trouble, it's better to be quiet, it's better to be silent, it's better not to make offence, yeah. cause offence. And I think that, um, what I want to make very, very clear is that I do not in any way condone the criminality um, of what happened um, at the News of the World or the excesses of the press. Um, but I, I remain fundamentally puzzled at the split that has taken place in, in the group that one would expect would continue to support, support freedom of, spe of speech and perhaps isn't asking the questions I think that need to be asked. Hello. Um, yes, the title of um, this book is Threats to Opinion Journalism. Um, and one would imagine that there's if anything, far too much opinion journalism out there at the moment. But I do occasionally write opinion pieces, and it's, it's a very enjoyable self-indulgent thing to do, basically, but, um, but fun. A few weeks ago, I, I was commissioned by The Guardian to write a piece about conspiracy theories um, about the Malaysian Airlines MH17 flight, which was shot down over Ukraine. Uh, the Guardian tends to commission me about three things, either free speech, conspiracy theories, or funny little Irish stories, <laughs> um, uh, which is, you know, it pays the rent. Um, <laughs> but I can never go home. Um, <laughs> so I wrote this piece, so the listing, because everything has to be a list now, the top five insane conspiracy theories about MH17, which ranged from a story put out by the, I think it was Interfax, one of the Russian state agencies, which claimed that the, um, the rocket was clearly fired by the Ukrainians and actually meant for President Putin's plane, um, to the claim, quite brilliantly, that Mossad, in their infinite power and wisdom, had several months previously hijacked the other Malaysian Airlines flight, MH370? Yeah. MH370, hijacked yep. that, hidden it on Diego Garcia um, for several months. <laughs> Why not on the moon? Because <laughs> it's too obvious, Martin. <laughs> First place you'd look. Come on, man. <laughs> they hidden it on Diego Garcia for several months. They had then launched the attack on Gaza, the current attack on Gaza, and at the exact moment when people started going, all these rockets and all these firing guns a bit much said, aha, they had then 
crashed this plane in Ukraine to deflect our attention from the Israeli army's actions in Gaza. Um, that was a quite sincere theory going around the internet. I, you admire the ingenuity and, and you know, just brilliant, you know, brilliant joining of the dots of everything. I always think conspiracy theories are wonderful because they give this great illusion that someone's in charge. Um, <laughs> it's brilliant. Someone knows what they're doing. They may be evil, but at least they know what's going on. Um, I, I normally don't get much abuse online. It rarely happens um, because I'm such a reasonable, boring person. Um, but fairly immediately after that, came, that article went up on the Guardian website, I got, and I'm going to try to avoid the swear words here, I got an email from a gentleman called, apparently called Neil McGowan, um, which started off with the title Keep Sucking Rasmussen's Big Norwegian Ex, Podrick. Um, Cram it down your pseudo Irish throat. I don't know why pseudo Irish <laughs> throat. Right, on and on and on. Um, various racial and homophobic abuse, blah, blah, blah. And lots of conspiracy theories about that, and lots of me being gay, which I'm not, not that it matters. Um, that was followed an hour later uh, with just a link um, comparing me to certain parts of a lady's anatomy. Um, and then another hour later said I was like Ian Paisley stumbling down the Falls <laughs> Road in a drunken stupor, uh, which shows an ignorance of Belfast geography and <laughs> Ulster Free Presbyterian views on alcohol consumption. Um, <laughs> now, Neil McGowan had, funnily enough, a Russian email address, which when I ran through the um, wonderful Google Translate tool, um, actually turned out to be, in Russian, Roderick Random. Um, which is quite nice. Um, this kind of thing happens increasingly. Um, I have absolutely no doubt that Mr. Neil McGowan, whoever he was, is paid for by the Russian state. Absolutely none. This is what they do now. Um, they, and this is what a lot of governments engage in now. Um, because the aim is, ultimately, to get people to stop writing. I mean, there, there are numerous examples that the, the sinister index and censor of Cabal can, can mention. Um, for example, uh, writing about... Um, Sri Lanka uh, towards the end, or trying to cover Sri Lanka at all towards the horrific end of the horrific civil war there was an absolute bloody nightmare for a lot of people. If, you, if, if people were to express any opinion at all, you would be bombarded, bombarded completely. Your website would be bombarded by pro-government people accusing you of being all sorts of things. If you tried to get involved in the discussion between the reds and the yellows in Thai politics, it's exactly the same. Um, this happens. You get bombarded absolutely with these things. Um, one of my favourite moments um, working at Index and Censorship, though it wasn't so much fun at the time, was um, writing about um, a colleague who, who, we've, who we've worked with, a wonderful uh, Canadian-Iranian journalist called Masiar Bahari, um, who had been um, captured by the Iranian government at the, at the height of the Green Revolution. He'd been covering it for Channel 4 and for Newsweek. Um, and he... You know, eventually, you know, was was released, um, came back to came back to Britain, and he launched a a um, large complaint with Ofcom, the the media, the, the broadcast regulator against uh, Press TV, the Iranian-run um, corporation, which did run out of London. Um, it's it's very loosely described as a news channel. It is conspiracy central. It is mad. And then you start. If you read Press TV, you have to remember that these people, are, this is, these are official Iranian government lines which constantly spout 9-11 conspiracy theories, everything else, it's mad. Um, so Maziar had been forced, was the word I used, um, Maziar had been under duress, made to give an, a, an interview while in prison, while in um, Evan prison in Tehran, uh, saying that, you know, basically that he was in the pay of Western governments, blah, 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 it was all untrue, um, but he just went along with the time. And he came back, came back here and said the press TV should not have been allowed to, to run this interview because you should not be allowed to interview people under duress. Um, <coughs> press TV, um, yeah, the, the Ofcom agreed um, and found against press TV, which at the time had, had a base in London, no longer does because they refused to pay the fine uh, in the subsequent um, argument. Um, so, I wrote for an extensive quick piece saying that Ofcom has found that Iranian journalist Mazia Bahari was forced to give an interview um, in Evan Prison. Um, 
And Press TV immediately um, sent a very strongly worded email um, to, to me and to my then boss in Nixon censorship um, saying that we had libeled Press TV because there is a difference between making someone do something under duress and forcing them. Um, not only had we libeled Press TV, we had committed incitement to religious hatred against Muslims and Islam for saying that, Muslim, that Press TV had done a bad thing. Again, the idea here was to stop people writing about these things. And the, the extraordinary thing that we do, I mean, the internet is a beautiful, wonderful thing, um, but as I'm sure um, you know, you're very much aware that, and other panels have addressed, there, there's a double-edged sword that happens, particularly when you're talking about expressing opinions about you, with the internet. It's a wonderful way of getting news out there. It's also a wonderful way to harass people endlessly and make them eventually think this just isn't worth talking about. When I started working in journalism, um, I can recall my first job was on an Irish newspaper, the Irish Examiner, and you know, to annoy a journalist, you had to go to quite considerable length at the time. Um, one would have to buy the green paper, green ink first, then one would have to get the you know, envelopes and send out. You'd have to write the letter and so on. You'd have to go to, the, go to the newspaper office, stand there for hours, and eventually someone would come and see you. Now you can just email, and you can email and, and email and email and email endlessly. Um, with the aim of stopping people. One can see, and, and it, it's getting worse. And what really worries me is that young, liberal, supposedly liberal people, if one particularly looks at debates on, on Twitter um, and so on about, about gender, about um, intersectionalities and anything, young, uh, there's, there's an incredible enthusiasm at the moment for shutting people down and for saying that people are saying unsayable things. That there's, I don't know if how many people here keep up with arguments about, um, about intersectional feminism, which, which if anything else, make me feel incredibly old um, because I don't understand any of these terms. But there is a real sense that people are not, that there is one way of talking about feminism now. And mm -hmm. if, if you deviate from it, not only are you wrong, you must be stopped at all costs. There, there, there's no mood for engagement, no need for conversation. Um, and it, it worries me because <coughs> I think if there's any point to free expression, I wrote this last week talking about boycotts, I think if there's any point to free expression, there, there is a, a maybe naive idea that if, every, if we get all the extreme views and get them clashing with each other, eventually we'll come up with something reasonable. Mm -hmm. And the idea that there, is, there, are several, there, there are real moves now on several levels to stop people engaging at any level is, is one of the most terrifying developments of the uh, that I've seen on the web. I think it has something to do with the fact that you can navigate your entire way throughout the internet and never find a thought that you disagree with. Um, and you, know, you can live in a little bubble and decide that people outside the bubble are wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, so I don't know what the answer to this is, sadly. Um, the, the, that's not the answer to the state sponsored stuff, is you just have to ignore it. But the answer to the individuals who really pursue this agenda, um, I am very scared to say I have no idea how to deal with this, and it's something someone's going to have to come to the conclusion of sooner or later. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm going to start abroad and I'm going to work my way to here, uh, to this room. Um, so the threats abroad, um, one, states have become more savvy about the way that they shut down dissenting opinion. So the first way states shut down dissenting opinion is they make it really difficult for independent newspapers to distribute their products. If you go to Azerbaijan, uh, which hosted Eurovision, which pays lots of uh, European MPs, which has a huge lobbying operation, uh, which has um, PR agents such as Matthew Freud, spin for it. Um, Azerbaijan, there's an independent newspaper called Azadlik. If you want to go and get a copy of Azadlik, you have to go to the newspaper shop uh, and then uh, you say, can I have a copy of Azadlik? Uh, and the newspaper shop owner gives you a kind of look, and then you say Azadlik, and your Azari friend will say, can he have a copy of Azadlik? And eventually, sort of, in a brown paper bag will come this opposition newspaper. It is the only opposition newspaper 
uh, that with, with really critical opinion about the government in Azerbaijan. To buy it, you have to look like a pervert. And they bring out this kind of brown paper bag with your newspaper in it. So you can't get it on the streets. So its circulation is minuscule. And that is the sole independent newspaper in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is not the only country that does this. It's quite commonplace that in lots of post-Soviet countries you have one distribution network for newspapers and it's owned by the state. Now one of the optimistic things about the way the world's going is we've got the internet now. And so a lot of online media is going, a lot of media is going online, which is great because then you don't have the distribution problems. The problem is that states are getting very, very clever at dealing with online news operations. Uh, so in Belarus, um, Charter 97 is kind of the most strident opposition uh, news, uh, newspaper website. And um, it's only published online because they can't get distributed. Uh, Charter 97 has state-run denial of service attacks against it the whole time. And what that means is the Belarusian government pays Russian hackers money to infect your computers, and this is computers all over, so people with viruses, you get a virus on your computer, it's probably, a, it might, you know, there's a good chance it'll be a Russian botnet. And your computer will sit there all day in the background accessing Charter 97, just refreshing the home screen. And they do it with 300,000 computers. And what happens is the website collapses because it can't handle the number of requests it's getting. This is an increasingly common technique, and it's, it's states paying uh, mafia and criminals to destroy independent news. Uh, and that's something that is uh, a growing problem. It's a very increasingly effective way of taking down websites. Um, plus, you've got other threats. You've got the threat of criminal defamation. Uh, criminal defamation means you say something about the president, the president sues you for defamation, uh, but he sues you for the law of criminal defamation, which means that you as a journalist in front of some kangaroo court get put in prison for eight years. You come out of prison with a criminal record. There are rules that say criminals cannot be journalists. Uh, and so you never get a job as a journalist ever again. In Europe, in the EU today, every single EU member state has the law of criminal defamation on the books, apart from five out of the 27 countries. So there's 22 countries where, if you're a journalist, you can be put in prison for what you write. I mean, that is astonishing in the year 2014 in the European Union, post-Lisbon Treaty, where we're supposed to have a Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, I mean, I think there's a real issue there. Um, and then also we've got this, finally, so to bring it a bit closer to home, we've got this new notion of privacy. And traditionally, when the authors of the European Convention on Human Rights were developing the, the, the Article 8 right to privacy, what was in the eyes of the author, uh, David Maxwell Fife and the other architects of the European Convention, was privacy, you were protecting your family life and your individual life from the intrusion of the state. And it was written in the aftermath of the Second World War and it was European authors thinking half the continent has been taken over by totalitarian Soviet Union and the other half has just been liberated from Nazism. And part of the other continent is now run by a fascist Franco regime, the Portuguese regime, which was a dictatorship, and uh, Greece, which became a dictatorship in 1948. That's not a great continent, by the way, and we've come a long way since then. But when they were, when they were writing this, they were thinking about state intrusion. In the uh, former Soviet bloc, privacy developed in a very different way. The idea of privacy wasn't intrusion from the state, which was given as a granted. The idea of privacy was for a small, cosseted, politburo elite uh, not to have intrusions into their personal and private life by journalists, right. right? So when these nice, sort of, fat old men of the politburo were at their datches, drinking champagne and living a life which nobody else had in the former Soviet, uh, in, the, in the Soviet Union. The idea was that journalists wouldn't take photos of them to expose the great myth of communism, which we were all equal. Now, switch to 1989, um, fall of the Berlin Wall, and slowly all of these countries join uh, the Council of Europe. So they become signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights. Over time, these judges, 
who have obviously grown up under communism, start taking a very different view about privacy. And it culminates in two decisions. <clears throat> One, the death of Princess Diana. The death of Princess Diana, which was at the time commonly associated with quite, quite serious press intrusion, um, led to a Council of Europe decision, framework decision, which said, we've got to do something about the press, you know, it was the press that, it was the speeding journalist that, you know, all this press intrusion has led to uh, the death of Diana. We can see this across our continent. We've got to do something about the tabloid media, not just in the UK, across the whole continent. There are too many invasions of privacy by corporations, not by state actors, crucially, by corporate actors. This leads to a landmark decision at the European Court, we, uh, sorry, a landmark decision in the Council of Europe where parliamentarians who have a vested interest, by the way, because they don't like their private lives being intruded to either, passed this, um, passed this uh, resolution, and it says we've got to take the issue of corporations intruding into private life more, more seriously. Second thing happens, there's a European Court of Human Rights judgment called Van uh, Hanover No. 1. And what the judgment essentially said was uh, a member of the Royal Family of Monaco was, I think they were on a skiing holiday, and they were out and about in a public place, and a journalist took a photo of them in that public place and they did a, you know, a quite a classic, remember the royal family, on holiday, isn't it nice? You know, classic kind of tabloid story. This was, I think it was Bill, the German tabloid. Uh, the, von, the, the von Hanover family sued. Um, the German court said, well, hang on a minute, they were in a public place, so that's, that's legitimate that they would have a photo taken and put in a newspaper. They went to the European court and the judges of the European court said, no, this is an intrusion into this family's private life. And when the opposition judges said, uh, when, um, the, um, when the case was put but no harm was done, they dismissed this claim in one paragraph. So it doesn't matter that no harm was done. If you're in a public place, you should have a reasonable expectation of privacy. That sent that judgment which still hasn't been repealed, is the fundamental basis for a lot of the super injunctions which are being imposed. So a lot of premiership footballers uh, you know, using super injunctions. Now, since 2004, which is the first Van, Van Hanover judgment, there have been a number of other judgments which have balanced the field a little bit. But the fact of the matter is that the law of privacy suddenly got tightened up, and we can have a debate about that, whether people believe that to be right or not right, <coughs> tightened up by judges at the European Court of Human Rights without a public debate in the United Kingdom about what we think the balance between privacy and freedom of expression should be. And we still haven't had that debate. And we saw it again with Leveson and the aftermath of the Leveson report, where Lord Justice Leveson put together a, a weighty and substantial report, but again, when it went to Parliament, this was rushed through Parliament in a number of days. There was no public consultation on the Leveson document. It was, a judge has said this, the three parties agree to this, we don't need to consult with Freedom of Expression Group, we don't need to consult with you, the people, we'll just push it through Parliament with almost no debate. The first, one of the debates in the House of Lords, I think, was 14 minutes from memory, right? Bash it all through, let's not cause trouble, we'll get this, that's over and done with. Now, that is the... That, Leveson report is now the testament, handed down, you know, in tablet from a, in a tablet, and you either believe in it or if you don't, you're a radical on the fringes of the debate, and that's where we are now. And I think that's really, really problematic because I actually think that there's a wider debate to be had about the balance of privacy, the balance of privacy between us individuals and states, which I think is a really important argument that we've got to have, debate that we've got to have. Because uh, I think that balance is wrong, too much in favour of states. The balance of corporations, where actually uh, News International would love to have the amount of data on us as individuals, as some internet corporations have right now. Uh, your mobile phone company has right now. That's a, that, so that's another debate we need to have about the balance between us and uh, corporations. Then finally, we need to have a debate around... Um, is... Is public interest the only gateway to publish? And some people think that we should have a news media which is totally centred around the public interest, i.e. 
The, the job of newspapers is to only publish things which are in the public interest and contribute to a wider public debate, right? Other people, often the media, and I tend to take a bit more of this view, think the job of newspapers is to titillate, it's to inform, it's to excite, it's to crosswords, bingo, celeb snaps. And I don't think that's an outrageous position to take. And somewhere in the middle there is probably, we're getting closer to the truth. But we've got, a very, we've got a very narrow debate where a lot of people feel that public interest is the only gateway. And I actually think what we need to do is stop newspapers causing harm, but public interest shouldn't be the gateway. Once you've passed that, you can publish. Prevent harm, yes, but also defend free speech. Thank you. <coughs> talking about Russia or this country? Um, either well, I mean, Russia, it's a whole other order of things because of the, <coughs> of the of, you know, there is no free press in Russia. And, and that movement of artists that Pussy Riot belongs to, which is called Voina, you know, they are, it's, it's art as civil disobedience. It's, you know, it's art as activism, as political activism. And so, you know, it's in, to a degree, it's, it's doing what journalists can't do in Russia, which is, which is speak out. And so the state has thrown the full force of itself at those artists and, as we saw very publicly, prosecuted them and imprisoned them. So I, I, can't, I can't make a comparison, you know, really. I mean, I don't, you know, art, I don't think we've got sort of comparative art. You know, obviously artists do engage in politics in this country. But there, it really is a sort of almost an act of, of civil disobedience. So I wouldn't want to compare Russia with this country. I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the good liberal position, the bien peasant position is to say, pussy right, brilliant, giving it to Vladimir Putin, right? fantastic, yeah? We should take the side of pussy right. And then you look at the debate about page three, right? Pussy right, incidentally, a lot of their art is highly kind of quasi-pornographic. It's really extreme, it's really out there. And it's deliberate to provoke a reaction against the, the, the enormous power of the Russian Orthodox Church and the, and the crossover between the Russian Orthodox Church and the state of Russia. So they deliberately use highly pornographic images as a way of kind of sending out a clear signal about the role of artists and free expression. Look at the UK and look at the way that people view the argument over page three in the sun. Now, we can have a debate about page three in the sun, but the bien peasant position is this is disgraceful the sun shouldn't publish it i don't want you know we need to close this down we need to you know not quite censor but i find it morally you know i don't i don't morally like it and you can hold both those positions and i don't think that they are necessarily wrong positions to hold but there is a contradiction there to a certain degree and i would like to you know i would like to imagine a day where a national newspaper in the uk publishes a piece of pussy riot extreme art on their front cover and then see how people react. But I think you'd actually see quite a similar traction to where Russian public opinion went with some of their art. Can you clarify what that means, page three of the sun is American? Oh, sorry, it's like... Um, Topless it, ladies. It's, yeah, ladies in bikinis <laughs> saying... Or ladies not in bikinis. Well, right. No, that, that's not the point I'm making. That's not the point I'm making. What I'm saying is, is that what Pussy Wright did was they deliberately tried to shock and offend and push back 
the barriers. And you're totally right, it is totally different, we can have a debate about it. What I'm saying is there is a, I think what we've, what we've ended up with is a, is a kind of, you know, the people who are critics of page three don't buy the sun. Okay, so what I'm saying is there is a, a light, censorious touch to this, which is people who do not go every morning and pay 30p to pick up a copy of the sun, are saying the sun should behave in a certain way, even though they're not the readership. So you can see what I'm saying. There's, there's a kind of, there's an argument about, well, I don't really want to see that, even though you don't see it. And that's also what put critics of Pussy Riot in Russia are saying. They're saying, I don't want to see this, even though they're not going to their art exhibitions. Thank you. 
of leading the campaign against the overbroad religious hatred uh, law. Uh, but as Joe said, uh, I spent a long time working and continue to work with her and the other two, and these three are three leading uh, people in free speech, and, and the three leading anti Leveson people in free speech. I haven't quite got a balanced panel in that respect. Uh, it's not a Leveson panel. Well, my exactly, so the Ben. Um, we wish. Because the guard and the independent dominate press, so this is the, uh, this is the, 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 the response. Um, but I work with them on, on libel reform, the campaign that I have found. Um, and Joe asked the interesting question why is it that all these people like me, and far more distinguished people, John Pilger, Alan Bennett, Beers Michael, Sigurd Rouser, Nick Davis, uh, Jonathan Miller, Nick Heiner, Richard Dawkins, over here, Michael Palin, Simon Rushton, Sir Tom Stockard, Philip Pullman, A.S. Byers, and scores of others strongly support the position that I work at now as the campaign's director backs off. And I would say it's none of the three reasons, except there's an anti Murdoch thing, except that clearly that motivates you to hear that. Some of the people who want to jump on anything that will control that path. Okay, it's not my motive, uh, but it, that is a factor. The reason is that they think it's a good solution, that it maximizes freedom of expression because it provides a right of reply for the poor people who are preyed upon uh, by uh, some of the press. Uh, and the curtailment of the freedom of expression of press only is very limited and only post publication. And there is not a shred of political control possible through the Royal Charter. I mean, it's got less Royal Charter political involvement than the BBC's Royal Charter, which is not usually pressed by politicians. So it's just the analysis is different, that's the answer. And we say exactly, we can't understand why you uh, and join with the others that are against it, against that position. So I think there just is a difference of view. Uh, we would say, uh, Patrick always picks me up on this when I disagree with people by saying they're wrong. It's kind of very... David Silver and Richard Dawkins. Um, but but you, there's never been a case demonstrated of how, not whether, but how you could get political interference through a, a royal charter that is independently appointed, has no politicians on it, no politicians on the appointments panel, and no politicians on the appointments panel of the appointments panel, and any change must be agreed unanimously by the royal charter body, which has no politicians on was not appointed by any politician, and whose appointments panel was not appointed by any politicians. I mean, that's six blocks there, yeah. and there's more as well. Yeah. So, so, the, so I, I think that, yes, it's true that there was a reaction against Leveson, led by powerful forces, led by powerful forces. But despite that, a year later, these people were prepared to very strongly say, we stand with the sorts of uh, people who I represent, who are the victims of the press, some well-known, some not well-known. The final thing I wanted to say was to say that there's a lot of dodgy language around this issue. Uh, and I'll just take with my final two points. Uh, page three, for example, and the super injunction. There's nothing in Leveson, and it's strange, isn't it? Nothing in Leveson that prevents page three. <coughs> What's annoying about page three for most liberals is not that it's naked women or semi-naked women, because unless you're opposed to any of that, being available uh, in magazines on the top shelf. Uh, that's not in itself problematic. It's that it's in a family newspaper that attacks everyone else for being degrading and sleazy. And people who have affairs, despite the fact that the two long term editors of the two biggest offenders were married and having affairs with each other during the time they were attacking other people who weren't hypocritical for having affairs. So it's the hypocrisy of it. Uh, as well as the unnecessary objectification in material that's available to children and frames their view of women. There's many suits in these tabloid newspapers and half naked women. And anyway, Leveson didn't, couldn't go that far. He said we need an independent regulator that, uh, that where the code committee, which is currently chaired by Mr. Paul Dacre, <coughs> is sufficiently independent to say, well, maybe it will be a code breach, maybe, to have. Uh, unjustified portrayals in this way. So but that still would be down to the industry setting up a regulator that had an independent enough code committee to consider it. The existing code committee has it. And on super injunctions, there's no, 
Anonymous injunctions taken out by people, usually to protect the families of the individuals, that's the Ryan Gage was the famous one, it was based on a desire to protect his children from being bullied at school if he was named as having an affair. And he was never a sexual moralizer, didn't argue other people should. And that was an anonymous injunction. It was not a super injunction, which is an injunction you're not allowed to know about. It was anonymized, because if you don't anonymize it, you defeat the purpose. And it's to say that people who were published to have AIDS, you couldn't say this person has taken out an injunction against this newspaper about a medical matter, which is none of their business and none of the public's business, because it would give it away. So there has to be a proper understanding of what the judgments are and why they're there. And it was amazing and interesting that in the recent trial, and we've got to kind of give them credit for this, the, let, the love letter from Rebecca Brooks to Andy Coulson, some of you, and I'm sorry my American colleague here is baffled by much of what we're talking about. Um, the love letter from Rebecca Brooks, the juicy bits, was suppressed by the judge on application of Andy Coulson's lawyer to protect his children from bullying the same organization that opposed every application to defend non-hypocrites, apostrophe, children from bullying. And the law worked for them. And that's the beautiful thing about the rule of law, okay? It works for both sides. And for too long, newspapers have behaved above and outside the rule of law. And that's why those people, I don't use arguments for authority usually, and I won't use one now, but that's the reason why those people feel that it was a balanced, reasonable report. Thank you. Thank you. A brief comment. I was slightly troubled by um, drifting this conversation, which is about the challenges uh, that the, the title is out there, uh, uh, to politicize it in left-right politics, both mm -hmm. by yourself and, and perhaps your first uh, uh, mentioning of the Thatcherite era. Um, I'm not in journalism, nothing but uh, LinkedIn. <coughs> um, this is a non-political issue, and this is uh, and it's perfectly underlined by the list of names uh, who supported Hacker. So I just want to ask for uh, ask the panel to drift it away from left-right politics. Yeah, I mean my my rant, I'll call it nothing else, uh, was aimed specifically at the hypocrisy of suddenly the right-wing press. Coming to the coming, talking about freedom of expression when they have actually shown no interest, no interest in it apart from in their own right to, to ex exceed their powers. They have behaved like protection rackets. Um, if, if the Daily, uh, the Daily Mirror uh, yeah. was also found to have done it, which is a, uh, for the Americans is a, is a left uh, yeah. uh, uh, of centre uh, paper. Would that not alter that your argument? No, 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 no. I mean, I work for the Daily Mirror, and I think they're almost certainly implicated in phone hacking. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, which no, is somehow no, not mentioned. Yeah, no, no, but, but well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, 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 but the Guardian is, it hardly has clean hands. None of them have clean hands. But, but to have enormously powerful people like Rupert Murdoch, who's an enormously powerful man with the complicity of British governments, most of which were conservative, uh, to augment his power. I'm making a point about power rather than sort of left mm -hmm. but I, and I, I, I take it much And I just think in my case, it, it's a genuine attempt to find an answer to a question. Uh, and um, and it, it's highly relevant. The politics is highly relevant as to how Murdoch began to grow his empire. It's highly relevant how that happened. And it may have been, it could have been another politician, but it wasn't. And it, it was a decisive period in British political history. Um, at which he began to, 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 to create his empire in this country. So I think it's highly relevant in, in trying to understand... He's also, he's also expanded his empire by cursing up to the Chinese can Communist Party, to the Australian Labour Party, to anybody yeah. who will give him a big... Can I, can I just say, the, the, the benefit of having an international congress is you can internationalise these issues. And what's interesting is, in, the, in, this, in this room, there are a number of Americans where they have the First Amendment, which is a heavyweight protection of freedom of expression. Now... There are criticisms of the American press. The American media ranges from New York Post and Fox News through to kind of established liberal publications of note. Uh, and they're all protected by the First Amendment. And America has a system of self-regulation. Uh, and even though it has this it enormously... 
Well, it has actually. Well, it has no internal yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> has internal ombudsman. Yeah. So even though the American press is left to its own devices, essentially, with no government interference or mm. royal charters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it still breaks brilliant public interest stories, and it still gives Americans a broad range of different viewpoints, which they can choose to pay for, or they can choose as individuals not to pay for. Now, my position as someone that advocates for freedom of expression, and I've worked with Evan for many years on, on the liberal reform campaign. But the reason that I am not as, I think the hacked off are complacent in one area. This is my key criticism of their campaign. Once you have a royal charter, and Evan says there's no politicians involved, well the royal charter was passed by privy councillors who are politicians on the whole. Once you have politicians stepping over the Rubicon and building a framework in law, and it, a law was changed, a law was passed, which places fines, significant fines for newspapers who do not join this regulator, then you do have political interference. And I give an example. Say, for example, the MP's expenses scandal was broken uh, uh, at the point at which there is a regulator which has been recognised. Right? All 600 MPs could go to the regulator and say, we individually make 600 claims to the regulator. Okay? So the regulator suddenly has 600 separate claims for MPs. Now, the Telegraph published these allegations over a series of weeks and months. So the regulator has suddenly got all of these claims. Okay? It's got one newspaper on the receiving end, and it's got the power to fine one million pound fines. Okay? It knows if it does not take this seriously, it could lose its recognition because the panel, which recognises it as a regulator, i.e. keeps it in business, has to report back to Parliament. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. It has to report back to Parliament. Yearly, Evan, it has to report back to... No, no, but it has to report... Evan, does it have to report to Parliament? Does it have to report to Parliament yearly? Does it have to report to... Does it have to report to Parliament yearly? It does, doesn't it? It's not allowed to report on any complaint decision. But it's still each year... It has no power to look any but you know that it does have to, each year, it has to go back to Parliament. And Parliament, incidentally, is the body for which all of these complaints, is making these complaints. You can see that there is a conflict of interest the minute you bring politicians into the fray. And I worry that a big scandal which embroiled the entire political class, this is why this has always been a principle the last 300 years. You keep politicians out of the equation because we have scandals which embroil the lot of them. How are the press going to stand up and risk exemplary damages, exemplary costs, a million pound fines when they're taking on every single one of your MPs in Parliament? The answer is no. Okay, you, you sir. Yes. <coughs> um, Bobby Mill. Um, I was going to ask, and I can't remember the, the date or the percentages, but soon after Blair came to power in 97, um, he introduced, uh, the, the Labour Party passed a law in Parliament reducing the amount of um, media that any one person or body could own and control from, uh, I, I think it was 35%, and he reduced it to 25%. I, I couldn't have got those figures wrong. But he was the one with Murdoch breathing down his back who enabled Murdoch to expand in the way he did. Am I right? Do any of you remember I that? I think it's the other way round, I think. No, he, he, he reduced the amount of, um, he, he increased he the increased amount screens. of, yes, sorry. Yeah. He increased the amount of, of the media that, that yeah. anybody could control. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that happened. I, I, I mean, that, that was one of the big features that enabled Barack to get his But power. I think that's, that's a, so that is a question of media plurality. Yes. So, and we've got to make sure that we separate media plurality, which is that there is lots of different forms of media that people get access to, which is part of the right to freedom of expression, and media regulation, which is yeah, sure. separate. Which is the point that Martin was making earlier. But, but I'm plurality ha ha also has a, a huge bearing on, on power. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <coughs> so I'd like to give a, an American perspective because I think Murdoch has had his um, stronghold on American media as well. So I'd like to ask, first of all, to practice it and then ask the question, but when you talk about media as the general topic and that which the news can be, mm -hmm. um, I would propose that we, uh, and in the US, we have the same regulation, and, and I don't believe it was self regulation at the time it was Reagan, in, you know, in uh, concert, I'm sure, with Thatcher and all that explosion of. Anyone can own any of our stations, and 
if you want to give it a personal opinion, then it's, it's no longer news. It may be media. Um, and then to take the advertising dollars out of news. But that is a public yes. service owed to the public from a factual perspective. And, and if you want to add a personal opinion so that you get the right and the left and every other freedom of expression, yeah. that's not news. That's now it's turning into an opinion and a thought. And, I, and I'm all for that. But I, so my question would be, is, is that in your mind considered censorship? Or are we owed some modicum of, of reality Fact-based um, news, as opposed to this mishmash of highly opinionated, left-right, political, religious, everything. Right now. That's um, that's a kind of a core. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's 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 quite a different it's differentiation eh, between between the U.S. Uh, system and the U.K. system, but also between uh, broadcast and 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 print. Or well, print seems to mean this term. Let's let's say words. Um, in, in, in Britain at the moment, uh, we do have quite strict rules on, on opinion in broadcast. Um, so yeah, the, there is the, the idea being, essentially, um, that broadcast is an intrusive media. Um, therefore, there is a justification in regulating it, that you can have the radio on the background and suddenly hear something quite different. Whereas if you go and buy a newspaper, you've made a conscious decision to say, I'm going by the Times because... I am of centre-right opinion, and I want to read roughly centre-right views on things. Um, whereas television supposedly isn't like that. Um, so it, it's it's kind of bummed along, and it, it's something that we've broadly accepted. Um, it is becoming, I think, harder to maintain. Um, there was an interesting moment a few weeks ago where um, John Snow, the generally quite highly respected um, Channel Four News um, presenter. Um, had been presenting from Gaza. Um, and afterwards, he put out a very emotional, personal appeal, which went on the Channel 4 News website, but did not was not broadcast on Channel 4 News itself, because more than likely, it would have breached broadcast um, impartiality standards. Um, and it becomes, you know, in the age of on-demand television, on the, in the age of streaming, you think, who's really making this distinction anymore? You know, are, are people really thinking, uh -huh, well, if it was on my television from the Channel 4 studio, that would be terrible, that would be a breach, and I'd complain to Ofcom immediately. But it's on YouTube, so even though it's in, filmed in the same studio by the same man in the same tie, um, it's somehow okay. Um, as media converge, I think it's going to become very, very difficult to make that distinction. I mean, we can, we can very easily say this is, you know, we, we, can, we label things that we do, we, we still have you know, even though I say, you know, we have roughly ideas, we do still have in newspapers, we do actually generally label things opinion and news, apart from when the mail uh, runs terrible pieces by Dominic Sandbrook saying <laughs> blah, 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 Stalin. Um, and they're presented as history um, <laughs> when they are clearly nothing stored. When, I mean, there was what a standing mail piece. Did you remember when Ralph Miliband... Um, Ed Milan's father, who had been a Marxist, who had never been a Stalinist Marxist. And <coughs> the, the mail ran a very long piece just saying, Marxism, Stalin, Gulag, Ed Miliband. Um, <laughs> with the headline, The Man Who Hated Britain. Yeah, with the headline, The Man Who Hated Britain. Britain. A man who had. Yes, a man who had fought for Britain in World War II. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's, 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 I don't. I, I, I can understand. Certainly, and, and as I say, it's not the, the Ofcom uh, partiality rules is not something that any free expression organisation in this country has ever gone to the barricades for. But I do see it being increasingly problematic in an age when, you know, news web, newspaper websites will do streaming and videos. Uh, the BBC website and Channel 4 news website runs more and more um, editorial. It's going to be difficult to sustain that idea because. We're all, you know, everything is going to come through the one channel now, whereas previously it didn't. Um, so far from saying we can separate these things, I think it's going to be harder and harder to separate, and we're probably, I would say, going to end up actually with more of the American model of very editorialised, but, but then at least, I think it's okay as long as we're clear that we know this is, you know, again, I'm watching Channel 4 News because I'm a roughly left-leaning person. I'm watching The Daily Show because John Stewart, you know, is 
roughly lefty liberal kind of person. I'm watching Fox News because I'm, it's right wing. Yeah, it, it, it's the, I think if the labeling is clear, then, then we're okay. If it's not, then we have a problem. Okay, we've got a question. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. I'm sort of hearing you talk very much about the British media as though it exists in isolation, accepting Murdoch who's an American born in Australia. As a British person who's lived in America for 25 years, I consume British media. I, I read The Guardian, which is, seems to be bigger in the US now than it is in Britain. <laughs> and The Economist is bigger in America than in Britain. But I wonder, picking up on your last point, how much the internet is dissolving all of these boundaries, not only within the media, yeah. so that you can basically choose what story to read by, just by using an aggregator. You're not actually choosing to read the newspaper. Yeah. Stories by <coughs> yeah. And, video. Yeah. and also in terms of national boundaries, what's to stop <coughs> an American website publishing everything that the Brit British are trying to stop? Nothing. Well, that's absolutely right. Well, that's, you're absolutely country. right, and that's that's what kind of makes a nonsense on one level of this whole debate that we're having here and of what's being put in place because it's going to be out of date before it begins. But I mean, the sort of a prime example of that is, is the Snowden story, where. Um, the cabinet secretary insisted that Adam Ruskridge and various other Guardian people had smashed up the, uh, the, hard, drive, the hard drives yeah. of computers uh, which contained information which was also in New York and everywhere. But also, Martin, interestingly, the thing about, about the Snowden story, it's a very interesting thing, is that the entire Snowden story was handled by the Guardian US. Yeah. It was very explicitly handled by Guardian US so that it That's would have First Amendment protections. And the now, story was led by a journalist who was in fact a blogger. Yeah. Except what they then discovered to their horror, because they thought that they would enjoy First Amendment protections, they later discovered that they wouldn't. <laughs> 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 but the, the interesting point that Matt makes I mean, is, is about the, the regulation, and, and as Joe said about the regulation thing, is for example why the, the Financial Times has said we will not be involved in any regulator, whether it's the, whether it's <laughs> the Royal Charter recognised one, whether it's the industry, and we're just not doing it. Yeah. And part of their justification was saying 75% of our online traffic comes from outside the UK. <coughs> Why the hell should we what, be beholden to a UK regulator? It, 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 uh, I'll come to you in a minute, sir. It raises a, a wider question, you know, among the, the challenges to news and opinion journalism is the fact that how do you find a journalist who claims to be a rules of blogger, who's something yeah. you know, Woodward and Bernstein combined. Uh, <laughs> and, um, People have always had a choice about where they get their news from. I don't think people have yeah. really believed the news they read in newspapers. They buy newspapers to reinforce their own political prejudices. Most of our fortitude and crossword have been sports before. Um, <coughs> but uh, I, I think, you know, just as the cabinet secretary wanted, didn't understand how computers work. <laughs> so he thought they, they were physically inside these little boxes. They were smashing them, they'd be fine. Um, we, we, don't, we, we don't understand how the internet works. We don't understand the implications of it that you can be lied to on Twitter, as we all know. It seems yeah. to you can be in the pages of the Daily Mail or the Daily Mirror, or any other paper you go to mention. Um, and, you know, let's hope we're all getting towards that happy time when the only thing we ever see is a kitten. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, concerning the job you, uh, our head of the acronym for this uh, convention, the world, uh, we have journalists in every country and every part of the world, is there uh, some kind of, of trend towards journalists talking across borders, uh, across cultural uh, borders, to try to dig through all the smut and unpleasantness, to dig down and get the truth out? Is there yeah. anything like that going on? Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, let's get the Kickstarters going as soon as we finish. There, there is. I mean, there, there are a lot of new uh, cross you know, multinational initiatives um, happening. Uh, there's always been a, a very broad based kind of idea of international journalism and solidarity, and we're very good at signing the petitions for everybody. Um, uh, Martin, I'd, li I'd like to at some point get onto what Martin's alluding to the difficulty of defining journalists, which is weird because sometimes we ask for special pleadings and sometimes we say, well, we're just exercising universal right. Uh, it, it's, it's tricky like that. But there are, there are models emerging which, which do, I think, break down that, the kind of national borders. There is, 
the oh. what's the Brad Mills one? The Bellingcat, for example, which uh, which is using Kickstarter funding to to dig into you know, forensically examining uh, forensic kind of citizen journalism. Uh, there is Beacon, which I think is a wonderful project where. If you are interested in a particular topic, I always use one example because a friend of mine is involved, so I like to plug her work. So if you are, for example, particularly interested in the US's involvement in drone attacks in Yemen, which no one is covering anymore, there mm. is no one at all is covering anymore, uh, then you can go online and you can say, I will sponsor um, now award-winning journalist Iona Craig, who is one of the last, I think the last remaining Western journalists in Yemen, or was until recently, um, I, will, I will pay for her to stay in Yemen and report on this stuff. I will not depend on Rupert Murdoch or the Barclay Brothers or anything, I will not depend on their largesse. As a person who's interested in this, I will pay for that content. I think we're getting back into the idea of paying for stuff again, but paying the people who actually produce it rather than paying the owners who then trickle it down. To bring this back very briefly, uh, to, to, to Lex, sorry we've been talking about Lex, and was sort of traumatised by a different discussion. One of the people who covered the hacking trial, uh, uh, tweeted constantly from the hacking trial, was actually crowdfunded, yeah. because it meant he had to give up his job to do it, to be in there for how many days it was. Which is, so he's a journalist, he's a journalist anyway, he's actually a, also a script writer of the detective series on TV, but he was actually providing really good journalistic funding. And it is significant, I think, Glenn, you've mentioned Glenn Greenwald, I mean, he's very, his, his trajectory could not have happened you know, yeah. in another time, so that he was essentially a constitutional lawyer who um, ultimately felt frustrated by working the law. He then got going as a blogger, writing on constitutional <coughs> legal issues, writing for Slate, I think, .com, yeah, yeah. and you know, then created a sort of significant reputation um, as, as somebody on sort of the post-Iraq 9-11, um, um, human rights violations, gained a significant reputation, then moved to The Guardian um, just before the whole Snowden story broke, and he was the one that Snowden approached, and if any of you have read his book, you'll see it's the slightly <laughs> hilarious thing where Snowden is desperately, kind of anonymously writing to him, saying, I've got stuff to tell you, I've got it's stuff to tell you, you've got to encrypt your email, you've got to encrypt your email, and Greenwald's going, ah, oh, oh, you know, just leaves it, and in the end, so they <coughs> had to go to someone, someone else. The story could never have happened, but, but that, this, that trajectory, that career, so he is somebody who wasn't trained as a journalist, didn't, didn't sort of climb <coughs> his way up through the uh, news. Prior to Snowden was getting an awful lot of stick from other journalists. Sure, who, who were very, and in fact, actually, yes, so and he's written in, in, in yeah. his, in his words. He's a terrible <laughs> <laughs> right, never mind, never mind. Um, That's it, it's terrible right. The, but it's very, I mean, he is, he sees, it's very interesting how he perceives himself. He does, if any of you have read his book, which I think is extremely good, um, he, he does see himself as a quite a lone voice, a lone crusader, and he attacks journalism in the United States. There's a whole chapter dedicated to the craven um, sort of Washington journalism that's completely corrupt and tied in with government and so on. But just here's an interesting example of what we're talking about, of the new, of the new kind of journalism. Thank you, sir. I'm Evan Brown from, from Norway. I, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on, on the media's responsibility to convey the truth. Because, in, you know, media has a tendency to be, you know, you, you should be neutral, you should be take no sides. No. And that the result of that is sometimes that you, you make kind of phony oppo opposing views. Like a, my, my, a debate on whether the, the earth is flat or not, and <laughs> you mean that thing, you mean the other thing, and you have the same thing with creation, creationism and evolution. And, and it, uh, does the media have a responsibility to take sides in those kind of matters where, where there is no argument actually scientifically on what, what the truth well, can is? Well, one problem that I used to be a journalist, I used to work for the BBC, and I used to work on exactly those programmes, like the Today programme, where they say, OK, this is the story, we're going to do five minutes on it and we want you to find someone for someone against <coughs> and that's your job and that's how you do it so on one level it's to do with the nature of news programs and how they're not they do they do not they do not essentially um the way that they what is the way they format news programs if they were going to do it properly if they were going to take a subject like creationism or climate change the proper way to do it would be to each time to have like a half hour a half hour discussion but that's not how they do it and so it's about, it's about 
we want this easy, we want it straight, we want it delivered in three minutes. So that's part of the problem. Um, but I also think the idea of truth, I mean, if you're, if you're going to take, if you're going to, you're talking about scientific truth, of something course. that's scientifically yeah, proven. Yeah. But, but there are many other There's issues not that many where, examples. where, say, if you take Israel-Palestine, um, that, that, but again, it suffers from the same, because of the way that news is formatted, the way that news is packaged, it suffers from the same thing, that we're going to have, you know, someone from Hamas, we're going to have someone from the, from, you know, spokesman person for the Israeli government. Again, what, who's going to learn or really be enlightened from any of that? It's just kind of punch and judy. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this ties across to what um, the lady said earlier about uh, news being news and it being factual. The problem we have with that, which I think is noble, I mean, journalism should be about the pursuit of truth. But my truth, which is, uh, I don't believe in any of the world's religions, major religions, okay? So my truth, if in my own newspaper or my broadcast company broadcasting for London would be, uh, all the world's religions are wrong, okay? And that's what my, what, how would the Saudi Arabian media operator uh, deal with that if it's the pursuit of truth and the problem is there's very few examples unless we're going to say that my truth is the correct truth and other people's truth is the wrong truth the reason that freedom of expression should be protected is what it gives is it gives this big open space where you can have all the arguments and all the debates and the way we get to truth is we have more freedom of expression we don't have less and the reason that in places like Saudi Arabia you have dogma and you have very narrow views of the world is because they curtail the space of freedom of expression using things like well, news needs to be accurate you mustn't offend people you mustn't insult people we need a tightly regulated media and so obviously the parallels aren't you know you know that's a very extreme example but you can see that the pursuit of truth a noisy opinion uh, and pluralism in itself is a good thing and just quickly on the point about um uh, the very kind of uh, artificial setup, which is how we often do journalism. The best thing about uh, the internet and social media is now that we're able to challenge that artificial construct. So on BBC Question Time or panel discussions or whatever, there'll be a hashtag. And during that hashtag, you'll see really interested links shared, which challenge some of the artifice of this, of this get-up. And so we don't have news isn't a monologue anymore pushed to us by wealthy media owners. To a certain extent it is. But it's now, a, it's now a dialogue where lots of people can enter the debate and we can inform ourselves, you know, how many, how many people have watched the news while scrolling down their smartphone or watched a panel discussion while looking at their smartphones. That's the way we interact with media nowadays. So it's a much more open debate. And that actually means we're far more informed than we, than we were previously. <coughs> Journalists now provide us of truth. What are the journalists there for? I think that there's. They're there to investigate. I think. Yeah. Sorry. I think that there is there is a particular problem with 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 science journalism and and with, and with science journalism, which often, which I think is what you're getting, and particularly because most newspapers don't really have science. A because most newspapers don't really have science correspondents. They have people to cover science stories for the news pages, um, and. Science stories tend to either fall into categories of things that kill, will cause cancer or cure cancer, um, or in the broader news sense, news, you know, as the old saying goes, you know, man bites dog, that's a story. Science stories tend to be the things that we find, the, the things that come out of science stories tend to be things that are counterintuitive. Now, often science isn't, counter, isn't this wow counterintuitive thing, it's a slow, interesting, involved process, which for your average journalists trying to sell to their desk editor saying you know some interesting you know research going on more research needed um you're not going to get that on page three it's not going to happen um what you're going to get is oh my god suddenly dates cure alzheimer's um hooray um, and you leave it that and then on in part 10 you get more research needed um and it, it is frustrating it's enormously frustrating i think for for most science people i think we you know the, uh, but yeah, and for a few years we did, you know, Ben Goldrick wrote the run for the bad science column, which did a brilliant job debunking and so on. But a lot of it, I think too much of it sometimes became about debunking and it's, it became, oh God, again, we can't, you know, have fun with anything anymore. We're just constantly <laughs> getting down on people. And it's very, it's, it's, it's going to take a lot, I think, for, for some kind of meeting of minds to happen between the scientific and sketchy community and, and understanding that journalists need 
a story, but journalists also have to come through the other way and just have a bit more respect for getting into those stories. And there are some exceptions. Alex Johnson are wonderful people doing this, but it's hard. It's hard to. Okay. Square that circle sometimes, I think. Um, I just want to say very quick about investigative journalism, that, that that remains one of the most fundamentally important roles of journalists, and Podra gave the example of how it you know, can be done now through sort of, hey, right, you know, give us some money and we can keep this journalist in Yemen. I mean, and just one of the great ironies, um, of course, around phone hacking is, is that it was just revealed by a journalist. Yep. And by that unbelievable, dogged determination of a terrier with a rag. Yeah. That, uh, and the other thing also is investigating journalists who are doing something illegal to uncover desperately unimportant and trivial stories. Oh, sure, but I just think it's important <laughs> to remember, yeah. to remember yeah. that. Uh, can I just go back to the title again? Yeah. Uh, because news um, has to be factual, and th there's no question about that. <laughs> uh, and that's well, a responsibility, but it, well, it must be. Uh, that's a responsibility of yeah. journalists. Opinion journalism, uh, I think there the question, to me, is, is it allowed uh, to be offensive or not? Oh, yeah. And this word offense, I think it's something that is not that thing, hasn't been mentioned. It can be an offense to another government, it can be offense to uh, a, a minority group, it could be offense to a religious group. Mm -hmm. And we as humanists, as uh, if I remember the uh, uh, definition, we were, we're supposed to act in such a way that we don't cause offense to <laughs> somebody else. <laughs> so yeah. as human. Well, if one, if um, some, can I just say, yeah. um, yeah. As, as, as a journalist, who I said earlier on, my, my job is to offend. I'm a cartoonist and a satirist, yeah. that's my job. And I have, uh, as my mantra, <coughs> in the back of my mind all the time, I think it was H.R. Maitland's definition of journalism, which is to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. <laughs> and that means you attack the powerful. That yeah. actually the purpose of journalism should be part of that sort of built-in kind of uh, air conditioning unit within the body politic to actually constantly harry the power and to keep them in their place. Uh, whether by drawing them with big noses or pointing out they couldn't their expenses or saying that their policies stick. And what went wrong with journalists and politics in this country was the power of the murder. They all got into bed with each other. Yeah. And therefore you didn't know who to trust or who yeah. to believe or who was whose client. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you know, I think both news and opinion journalism both should serve that purpose which is to afflict the country. Mm -hmm. But I think that what you've put, raised is a, com is a conflict for humanists. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. Sorry. I've just come Dilemma for a humanist is 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 how can you how can you ensure that freedom of expression thrives while not causing offence? Because if you, if you can't, one of the biggest problems we've seen over the last sort of twenty years or so is is the the rising belief that we mustn't cause offence. That in order to sort of live together in harmony and have a sort of decent society, we must not cause offence. And we've seen the impact that has on freedom of expression, which is quite a serious one, I think. So I, I'll, be yes. I'll be talking about this in my session at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. With pictures, lots of pictures, <laughs> and a great deal of offence. Um, in all directions towards everybody. Um, thank you very much to our panel. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.